I want to continue this morning with the topic we have been looking at second, we've been looking at doing life together, but today we're going to go to Second Kings, and I invite you to turn with me in your devices or Bible. Again, we welcome those who are joining online. Do join us, get your Bibles, follow along with us. Just uh, do warning here, again, at Second Kings, do warning, I talked to our most amazing PowerPoint person here, and I said, I'm praying for you this morning because I have no idea how I'm going to put all these notes together. So if, you, if, you, if I say something and you see something highlighted, throw it up. Other than that, I don't blame you for anything. And so none of you blame her for anything because I'm going to go on a bunny trail. I want to tell a story this morning, and it's hard to tell a story when you have notes. So because you just... Stories are stories. They evolve as you go. So uh, we're going to be doing, telling the story that is here in Scripture. So here we are. We're finding ourselves in the place of, as a nation, as a, really as a people around the world, a people that are returning, trying to figure out returning to life as normal. We're trying to figure that out. So that has been fairly phenomenal. My, uh, I shouldn't say my parents didn't experience it because they had to try to turn, return to life as normal after a world war. And I'm going to say that was even more disruptive. But it's, it's unusual, these moments and times that they have been, but they're not unprecedented. History's been filled with thousands of these moments, not COVID-19, but thousands of moments where everything got disrupted. Normal life was thrown out. So it, there is no such thing as really normal life. We can go on a rhythm for a while, but life has the uniquenesses that are thrown at us. And and so we're trying to return. This is not just a return of a nation to what might be normal life, but many, we need a return to the Lord. We need a return to the things that God purposed in our life way back then. It's time to come back, he says. It's time to return. And so he's calling us to a place of return. So we last week talked of return, and in that, if you remember, we were looking at Zechariah chapter 1. The Lord said, if you return to me, what was the last of it? Tell me. I will return to you. Thank you, Lori. I will return to you. If you return to me, I will return to you. There, there's, if you return to me, turn, return to me, if you turn your face toward me, if you turn your face toward me, if you surrender your life to me, you'll have all of me. And anything less is not enough. If you return to me. Jesus would say in John 10.10, 10, he says, the thief has come to steal, kill, and to destroy. And he does that, and he does it all the time. And he's done that among some of you here, maybe all of us. You can testify where the enemy of your soul has stolen from you. And attempted to destroy you, and certainly maybe death is still. Death, not physically, but death. There's been death. Death of a dream. Death of of your, your job. Maybe your job came to an end. Not to have it anymore. Death of a career. Death of um, a hope in your life. There's been deaths. Because he kills. That's what he does. But Jesus continued, but I have come that you might have life. Comma. Remember what I said last week? Comma. And have life to the fullest. The question I put to everyone last week was, what side of the comma do you want to live on? Do you want to live on the side that you just are surviving? Because there's a lot of surviving people today. Surviving another day. More pay, you know. One more day, more pay. One more day. Just get me by one more day. Or are we going to live on the other side of the comma? I want life for the fullest. I'm not satisfied for less. God, if you've given that which is fully mine, not out of greed, but out of provision, then, Lord, that's what I want, and nothing less. And anybody who agrees with that, would you say amen? Amen. 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 May that be our life, the second part of the comma, the other side. Well, and we talked last week of Lazarus, and Lazarus who came back to life. It's not enough simply to come back and have the swaddling clothes around you. You need to be free to live. There's life, but there's life to its fullest. And we're believing that. We're believing a full return. So today is about that. We're continuing on. It's a story of the Old Testament. And we pick it up in 2 Kings 
chapter 5. I'm just going to read the first few verses and then I'm going to kind of tell the story. Now Naaman was commander of the army of king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master, highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now the bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel. She had served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of leprosy. Father, we ask this morning that you would show us a principle here that was spoken of of virtually every prophet. If you return to God, he will return to you. God, I pray that you would help us to understand that in the context of this story. We pray, give us wisdom, give us understanding, give us revelation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me tell you the story. It's wrapped up in here, but I, it, 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 It has a little injections into it that makes it a little bit confusing, and if we had a long time, it would actually take about 10, 15 minutes to read the whole story. So I'll tell the story. Be as accurate as possible. Naaman. Everybody say Naaman. Naaman. He starts the story off in chapter 5. Naaman is a general of an army of Aram. He's a man of power. He's a man of great wealth. Power meaning he has led armies into great conquest. He's been victorious. He's still alive. That's how you can tell he's been victorious. And he has accumulated. It's not uncommon that they would take the, the, the goods of the land and they would enjoy them for their own pleasure. He had lots. Name it. He had everything. He's in the top of the game except for one thing. He had COVID-19. Or sorry, no, he had leprosy. No, he had leprosy. Leprosy had no cure back then. Leprosy was a death nail. Leprosy was the equivalent, I would say, of today's cancer. You get it, not good news. You would die. He was moving on into more advanced stages of leprosy. He still had place of command. He was dying. Now, in one of his earlier raids, they had taken a town, and in that town... Often they would take slaves back and they had taken this young girl. It's estimated she was a teenager. They, maybe her parents were killed. Maybe they just took her from her parents. We're not told. But she was taken prisoner from her land of Israel and forced to serve Naaman's wife. Now, she's serving the wife and Naaman, of course, has leprosy. Everybody knows he has leprosy. And she goes to her mistress And she says to her mistress, if Naaman goes and sees the prophet back in my hometown, he can be healed. The God of Israel can heal him of leprosy. Now I'm going to pause the story here for a second because I want to focus on her for a second. Teenagers, you have tremendous potential. Tremendous potential. Here's what strikes me about this unknown named servant slave girl is she took the higher road. She had every reason to be angry and bitter and hate her master. But instead, she took the high road. And the high road was, I will not allow my circumstances to dictate my heart today. I will serve with a good attitude. I believe God is raising up a new generation who serves with... This whole story takes a whole turn if she doesn't do what she does. She's... A a woman of God, a woman of character, somebody to be recognized. She goes to the mistress and says, my master can be healed. He's the one who stole her away from her family. But my master can be healed. She cared enough. So let's continue on with the story. So the word gets to Naaman that this can happen. So he he goes through a letter writing process. He goes to the king. It doesn't go very well. So he just goes to Elisha's place. He takes a caravan with him. He shows up with his chariots, his entourage. This guy's got means. He's got money. He's loaded with silver, loaded with gold, loaded with jewelry. He goes to Elisha because he's asking a really big favor. He's asking for his life back. He's been ostracized from his family. He's been put. Often will have to dwell and sleep at night times in a colony. He's, he's got no hope, no future. So he goes to Elisha. 
And he goes and he knocks on his door. Let me pause frame again. Let me tell you a little bit about Elisha. Elisha's my guy. Oh, I like Elisha. If you know anything about you, me, you know I really like Elisha. Elisha, of course, came after Elijah. You can keep the two straight. Elijah, Elisha. Why, do, why can't they have more variety of names? But Elijah's first, Elisha's second. That's the way I remember. So if you have a lisp, Elisha's second. So now you know Elijah came before Elisha, and Elisha served Elijah. Now, Elisha, remember Elisha? He, I, I shared last fall the story of Elisha, I, a number of messages. Elisha went to the king of Assyria, and the king was wondering, is God going to bless me? And Elisha, he was an old man by then, probably months from dying of old age. He comes in behind the king. He says, now pull back the arrow. And he says he had his hands on the arrow. Pull back, and he's behind him. And he shoots, the king shoots the arrow, and the arrow goes far. And Elisha says, there's many blessings that God has upon you. And Elisha says, now take your arrows and strike the ground to see how, how committed you are. And he struck only a few times. And Elisha, as an older man, lost it. He was angry with him. How come you didn't keep striking until there was but splinters left? Why did you stop so soon? You're half-hearted. The kingdom will be taken from you shortly. You're half-hearted. You're half-hearted. What a story of half Because Elisha was not a half-hearted guy. He was all in, all in, all in. When he was anointed by King when I came, prophet Elisha, when he put his mantle on him, he sold everything he had, burned all the bridges behind him, and followed Elijah. He would not take his eyes off Elijah. Elijah tried to shake him multiple times, and others stopped, but Elisha stayed with him, if you know the story. He stayed with him right to the very end, to the point where Elijah's about to be taken to be with God in that whole you know, chariots of fire ordeal and that whole thing. And just before he's about to be taken, he stops and he turns to Elisha. Elisha's life came to that moment where Elijah turns to him and says, what is it you want? What is it you want? Now, you know, that would be a time to pull out the list. Well, I like a really nice home. You know, it's unaffordable these days in the GTA. A nice home. Mortgage paid, you know, and second, you know, some of you are looking for a wife, some of you are looking for a husband, you know, you could have gone through that checklist, I want 10 children, you know, all that stuff. What did he ask? You know the story. He says, I want a double portion of the anointing. And Elijah says, that's a tough one. But if you keep your eyes on me, when I go up and all the distractions, it'll be yours. And Elisha did. And it was his. So that's our Elisha. So here he is. Naaman's going to his house. He knocks on the door. Now, I don't know if his Naaman knocking on the door. Probably not. He has leprosy. Probably has somebody else doing it. Again, there's a whole caravan. They're loaded with goods. It would be the equivalent of coming up and going under our carport with a Rolls Royce. Like, my eyes would pop. And so, Elisha's servant, he sends a servant his name is Gehazi. Everybody say Gehazi. God bless you. Sounds like a sneeze, doesn't it? And he servant comes to the door, and Naaman gives the whole story. Leprosy, the whole thing. And if, 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 if you can help us, you know, these goods are yours. So Gehazi goes back, talks to the boss, and the boss says, this is the Lucas translation, jump in the river. That's the Lucas translation. Really what he said is go to the Jordan and dip seven times. But that's how Na Naaman heard it. When Gehazi came back out and said, by the way, boss says to go to the Jordan River. If you dip in the river seven times, you'll be healed. You'll be washed. You'll be leprosy. will go. You'll be cleansed. Naaman heard it this way. Number one, Naaman is used to speaking to kings. How dare the prophet send his servant? Number one. Number two, the Jordan. Now, how many here have been to Israel? Anybody here been to Israel? Okay, a few of you have been to Israel. How many have been to the Jordan River at Israel? It's one of the muddiest rivers out there. It is, it is dirty. I did a baptismal service in the Jordan River. Dirty river. You just walk in, you don't know what's under. And Naaman, you could tell the disdain because he's not from that country. Naaman has a disdain for the Israelites. He said, if I wanted to bathe in a river, I would go back to my home country. The Jordan's dirty. The third thing was, was that um, dip seven times, that was an insult. I, I believe it poked his core pain, his inner core pain. 
You see, Naaman had leprosy, and when people had leprosy, they go around, and before they could go around to anybody, they had to cry out what? Unclean! Unclean! So the remedy had to do with washing. Did you notice that? The remedy had to do with washing. It was like, poke the bruise. I'm unclean. Go and dip seven times in our dirty river, and you'll be clean. That's how we heard it. Jump in the river. He was so angry, the Bible says, he turned around in rage and left. He turned around in rage. Took off. Got some distance down the road. His soldiers, with great fear and trepidation, approach him and say, Naaman, if the prophet had asked you a difficult thing, if it had been a big deal, you would have done it. But because it seems so humiliating, you've chosen not to do it. Why don't you at least try? Naaman had earlier said, you know, why couldn't the prophet at least? He could have waved his hand over my leprosy. He even said that. He could have called on the name of his gods. He could have done any of that, but he did none of it. He just told me to go and jump in the river. Seven times at that. A dirty river. So the soldiers told him, if, it, if, he had, if he'd asked you a difficult thing, you would have done it. He asked you such a humiliating thing. Yes, granted, granted. Why don't you just do it? So Naaman did. He went to the river. Brings up my very first point. My first point is this. Obedience is God's excuse to bless you. You need to obey. I believe if he, only, if he stopped at four and thought, this is ridiculous, I believe he wouldn't have been healed because seven was what was spoken. I believe if he kept dipping, he figured, well, if I'm clean and healed at seven, I'll keep going to ten see what ten does for me. He would have lost the healing. The point is, is radical obedience. Radical obedience. When God is asked of something, why is it we negotiate? He's God. We don't have a negotiation platform. So in this particular instance, here he is. He is dipping seven times, and he comes out seven times, and the Bible says he's like the skin of a child, cleansed from top to bottom. What a beautiful story of this right there, all of that, just right. And he is so elated. I mean, he, back home, they had multiple gods, no more. He's a one God guy. He knows who the God of Israel, Jehovah God, is the God to serve. He wheels around, he's going to go back, he's got his caravan, his entourage, his Rolls Royce, on. He, go, he comes back into Elisha's place. This time, Elisha's waiting for him. Big smile, I'm sure, on his face. He comes back. And he says, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Listen, all this is yours. All this is yours. Now, Elisha makes a comment. He says this. He says, as surely as the Lord in whom I serve, no thanks. As surely as the Lord in whom I serve, no thanks. No, you take it back with you. I can't take any of it. Now, he's not independently wealthy. Elisha's not wealthy. These prophets depended on people's giving. They were full-time in ministry. They depended on what people gave in generosity. He's not wealthy at all. And so, no thank you. And Naaman was so, he's, he, his life has changed. Naaman says, can I take a hunk of dirt back with me? I like to call it holy dirt. Take some holy dirt back with me. And go ahead, take it. So he loaded up his camels and off they went with all the jewels, all the gold, all the silver, and some holy dirt. But he's healed. Beautiful story. And off he heads into the sunset. Now, Gehazi. Back to Gehazi again. Gehazi's standing there going, I can't believe this. Two times we had means in front of us. And he just left us. Just off he goes. Two times. And so Gehazi chases after him. Some distance down the road, Gehazi gets up to him. Gehazi is determined in his heart. Gehazi has said in his heart, as surely as the Lord lives, I'm going to get this back. Now, here's an interesting part. When I was reading through that particular text, and if we were reading it, you'd see the note. Gehazi in his heart says, as surely as the Lord lives, because that's exactly what Elisha had said. He had said, as surely as the Lord lives to Naaman, as surely as the Lord lives in whom I serve, as surely as the Lord lives. There's a difference there. You see, when Gehazi said it, he left out something very, very important in what Elisha had, in Elisha, Elisha had said. Surely as the Lord lives in whom I serve. That's his God. He was still focused on one God, one God only. Gehazi said, as surely as the Lord lives, but it's not the God. He departed. He was in a moment of temptation. He was in a moment being drawn away, and he failed this moment. 
He had journeyed with Elisha on a number of journeys. If you were to go back to chapter 4, you would read where Gehazi's name first comes up. You have Elisha, you have Gehazi, and there's a woman called the Shunammite woman. Why is she called the Shunammite woman? We don't know her name, and she's from the town of Shunam. So she's a Shunammite woman. So the Shunammite woman had no children and comes across the path of Elisha. Elisha perceives the need of needing a family, needing a son, and prays, and God gives her miraculously this son. The son grows up, he's a little boy, and very suddenly, unexpectedly, he dies. She goes after Elijah, she goes back to Elijah, and she says, my son is dead, would you bring him back to life? This woman has faith. Would you bring him back to life? And Elisha, in that story, if you read, sends Gehazi to do the work, but the woman says, no, 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 I'm staying with you. That's why Elisha and her got along so, so well, because she could not be turned back. Neither could he. She stayed with him. She stayed with him, all out for God. Not a half miracle, not a part of a miracle, all of it. Remember, our theme here is return. Are we going to return fully or are we going to return just surviving? So that's the story. And so in the story where the son of my woman, her son is restored, he's raised from the dead. It's a marvelous story. We just get that a chapter before. It's the whole story. And so that's the same Gehazi that is here, Gehazi, who chased after Naaman, and he gets a hold of Naaman, he stops him, and, he, and Naaman says, hey, hey, everything okay, everything, is Elisha okay? Yeah, yeah, but by the way, he's changed his mind. We could take this right here. So he takes it, he takes some of the supplies. It was not true, he, he was lying. He took the supplies, and the Bible says he went and hid them. Then he goes home. Now, how many know this is going to have to end up bad? He's going home to a prophet. Okay? He hid something. Think about this. He hid something and now is going before a prophet. So he goes home to a prophet and Elisha meets him. Where have you been? Elisha asks him. Gehazi, <laughs> well, nowhere. Nowhere. That's how he answers. Nowhere. And Elisha says, God sees everything. And judgment will come upon you. The leprosy that was on Naaman now has been moved over onto you. And immediately, he didn't start tingling and losing feeling. Immediately, the leprosy, the advanced stages that was on Naaman came upon Gehazi. Judgment. Judgment. Brings me to my second point, and it is this. God is less interested in your comfort than he is your character. He's interested in your character. He's interested in forming you. And we will go through things, even now, we will go through things and develop character. God is very interested in your character. Life was never meant to be a rose garden. And so in your difficulties, is godly character growing? Naaman's leprosy will now be upon you. Now if you wondered, poor, and, and so he, now his life is forever messed. He can't, you know, he, he can't have family, he can't have relationships, he can't hug people again. He's going to be banished to a leper calling, and he's going to die a horrible, horrible death of leprosy in probably just a few years. Leprosy. And if you wonder if Gehazi's going to have a hard time telling his wife that he just, what he did, don't worry about it because she's got leprosy and the kids got leprosy too. The whole family got it. Pronounced it upon the entire family. And chapter 5 stops there. As a matter of fact, let me just read the very end of chapter 5. Chapter 5 ends by saying, Naaman's leprosy, verse 27, will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence and his skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. Judgment. Seven years now moves along. Seven years. We come, a number of little things happen. We come to chapter 8. And chapter 8, the story picks up. We go to chapter 8, if you want to go there. It says, Now Elisha, verse 1, had said to the woman whose son he had restored to life, Go away with your family, stay for a while wherever you can, because the Lord has decreed a famine in the land. It will last for seven years. So the Shunammite woman that we talked of back in chapter 4, Elisha goes to her and says, There's a famine, it's coming for seven years. You will die, and you and your son will die if you don't leave this country. You need to go and look after yourself. And so she picked up lock, stock, and barrel and left seven years. 
Verse 2, the woman proceeded to do as the man said. She and her family went away, stayed in the land of Philistines seven years. None of this. Verse 3, at the end of seven years, she came back from the land of the Philistines and went to appeal to the king for her house in the land. The king was talking to, who is it? Gehazi, the servant of the man of God. Okay, let's pause. Okay, now, we left him three chapters ago. He was dying of leprosy. Banished from being around people. Three chapters later, chapter 8, he is standing before the king telling stories. What happened? We aren't told the details, but we can put pieces together. Number one, he is alive. Okay? He's alive. He should be dead. He was judged away back there. He should be dead, but he's alive. He's not only alive, we know he doesn't have leprosy. How do we know he doesn't have leprosy? He's talking to the king. He's leprosy free. He's talking to the king. He's in the presence of royalty. I mean, he's not surviving. He's fully alive. He's fully alive. Something has happened in his life that has brought him to this moment. And so the king has talked to Gehazi and is talking to Gehazi and he says, tell me the story of that Shunammite woman. That's a good story. You were there, and Elisha. Tell me the story of the Shunammite woman. And so Elisha begins to tell him firsthand the story of chapter 4. And he begins to talk about the story. And he goes through the whole story. He gets to the end of the story of the Shunammite woman, and a knock comes on the door. And they open up, and it's her and her son. Seven years later, it's her and her son. The last point I want to share is it's called the seven-year miracle of return. The seven-year miracle of return. In the Bible, number seven is a significant number. It's a number that really does bring completion. It's a number of freedom. It's a number of return. You see the number seven. We saw it earlier. It go dipped seven times. It was seven. He dipped seven times. Eight, six, seven. Dipped seven times. Told seven we also know that in the order of creation, God in creation said on the seventh day, on the seventh day, there will be rest. There will be a release. There will be a return of all that you've labored for. You will receive return to you. They actually had a seven-year return in their whole living system. So they had a time of slaves and servants. And in the time of slaves and servants, every seven years, masters, this was a rule that God had set down. Every seven years, you've got to let your slaves go. You got to release them. They're not your property. You release the slaves. And so seven years, the masters were told to go to their slaves and they were released. They were released with blessing and everything they'd accumulated. They were allowed to go. Some slaves chose not to. They continued to work as a hired servant, but they were released after seven years to go. It was a seven year return, return back, return back. And so in this story, the picture here is Gehazi in chapter eight. We see that after seven years, seven years, the Shunammite woman comes back. Seven years from having left the country. She had bought a house. She had property. When she left, it got assumed. It got annexed by those around. When she came back in, she had to go to appeal to the king to get it back again. She showed up at exactly the time Gehazi. Gehazi should be dead. But something happened in the life of Gehazi. You see, our God is a merciful God. And what seems like a verdict today does not have to be the verdict of tomorrow. I can find forgiveness. I can find freedom. His grace is sufficient for right now. And here's the call. Sometimes we live in the place where we feel condemned. We, we're feeling shame. Maybe we're in a period of reversal like Gehazi would have been the last of chapter 5. But our God is a merciful. Somewhere in there, Gehazi came into a healing experience. Otherwise, he would never have been standing before the king in this particular chapter, chapter 8, conversing with the king, telling the story seven years later. Beloved, this morning, if we talk about return, that's the call of the Lord. Whatever, again, we come back into the obedience is God's excuse. To, it starts with the place of absolute radical obedience. And secondly, God's not interested so much in your comfort. He's developing your character. How many here testify your character is being developed these days? Okay, character's being developed. But here, seven-year return. It's time to come home. There's an appointed time where God will pour out his spirit again. He's a merciful God. 
And I'm believing that for this day and age. I'm believing that for our time right now. I'm believing that for families in Cornerstone. I'm believing that for families across this community. I'm believing that across this nation. Oh God, let this be now a time of return. We understand something about returning back to work, returning back to church, returning back to our schools, returning back. But God, let this be a time of return to you. Through radical obedience, the development of character, the seven-year return of freedom may it be upon us right now. I want to pray for you. And maybe you are in that place where you need to return. So return. Turn your heart, like name and turn your heart and say, listen, it's very humbling, but God, you are merciful. God, I submit my life to you. Turn it over to him. So Father in heaven, I pray right here, right now, oh God, that you would, by your spirit, reach down into our hearts, into our lives, and God, let there be a return to you. Lord, although it might be humble, although it might be difficult, May this be the hour of great return, I pray. Lord, I pray for those that maybe feel like all is hopeless. Lord, I hold up our youth right here. I hold up our children. I'm going to invite the worship team. Come on up, worship team, if you would. Just Everybody, if you could just remain in place of prayer. Father, we just want to pray, and can, I invite you to agree with me. Just come into agreement in this prayer. Lord, we, we want to pray for our kids and youth. Lord, just like this slave girl whose attitude would not be deterred by the circumstances around her, God, we cry out for our youth right now. Oh, God, raise them up, we pray, in this hour. Raise up our sons, raise up our daughters, that they would be men and women whose attitudes would be focused on you, that their hearts would be hearts that go after you. In times where it seems like they have no voice, that they will lift what they have and they will proclaim goodness and blessing and prosperity. Oh God, raise up that generation that will be a blessed generation, we pray. God, I pray that you would raise up those who maybe have grown up in backgrounds, just as BJ earlier mentioned. In a background, maybe didn't have a father, didn't have some circumstances that were favorable. And God, there are those who are here. That is us. Our past is not favorable. But oh God, that does not dictate what our tomorrow is. God, I pray like Naaman, although his past was not of the God of Jehovah, his future would be the God of Jehovah. And Lord, I pray that you would cleanse us and that, God, you would wash us and you would purify us and you would reinstate us and give us life again. God, bring back the return. Lord, I pray for those maybe who feel and can relate to Gehazi, that they've made some big mistakes. They have sinned against you. They have not served the God in whom Elisha served. It was the God of their own heart, the God of convenience. Maybe it's the God of pleasure. We enjoy pleasure more than we do you. We enjoy things, maybe material things, maybe finances, maybe our jobs, maybe our school, maybe our friends. We have placed them above you. We've enjoyed self-effort above you, whatever it is, maybe our careers above you. And so God, we have dismantled you from the throne of our heart as Gehazi did and then we lie to cover up to make it look as if we're okay but God we know that in the heart in the heart of hearts your Holy Spirit is revealing just as he did through the prophet Elisha no something's wrong here something's wrong Lord I pray that we don't have to accept the verdict that we are forever lost because by your mercy and grace here we find ourselves today ability to return So, Lord, I pray for each one who maybe can relate to Gehazi. Oh, God, we have blown it. We have fallen short. God, we ask you to forgive us. And, Lord, cleanse us. Reinstate us. May your blessing be upon upon us. Lord, we are people of radical obedience to you. Let it be, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a song. The song goes like this. When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, raised me, filled me with the Holy Ghost, healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how he picked me up, turned me around, placed my feet on a solid ground, 
I trust it makes you want to show. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. We're going to sing that song. If you know it, just join along. Uh, just, just let this be your testimony. If you don't, learn it. It's a great song. Would you join us in standing? Pastor is just going to lead us in worship before we close in prayer. save us from all our pains, all our stresses, all our financial difficulties, all the addictions we may have, anything that we can have as a problem, he has the power to save, amen? So let's praise him and worship him, take the moment to reflect upon his glory and his power. When I think, when I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the hours. When I think about the Lord, how he picked me up and turned me around, how he set my feet on solid ground. Let's do it one more time from the top when I think. When I think about the Lord, how He saved me, how He raised me, how He filled me with the Holy Ghost, how He healed me to the utmost. When I think about the Lord, how He picked me up and turned me around, how He dressed my feet. Solid ground, it makes me wanna shout, makes me wanna shout, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, Lord, you're worthy for all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. It makes me wanna shout, makes me wanna shout, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, Lord, you're worthy. The honor and all the praise. Let's sing it. When, when I think about the Lord, Lord everyone, when, when I, I think, think about, about the Lord, Lord, how He saved yes, me, how He raised me, how He filled me with the Holy Ghost, how He healed me to the utmost. And when I think about the Lord, He picked me up. How he picked me yes, up, turn me around, turn me around. How he set my feet on solid ground, on solid ground. Makes me it wanna makes me shout. shout. It makes me wanna shout. Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus, Lord, you're worthy of all the glory, all yes, the honor, yes, Lord. all the praise. Makes me wanna shout. It makes me wanna shout. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, Lord, you're worthy of all the glory, all the honor, and all the Sing it one more time, makes me want to shout, and it makes me want to shout. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, Lord, you're worthy of all of the glory, and all the honor, and all of the praise. Wanna shout, Hallelujah! Thank yes, Lord, Jesus, Lord, You're worthy of all of the glory, and all of the honor, and all of the praise. That's it, salt. It makes me want to. Makes me wanna shout, Hallelujah! Thank You, Jesus, Lord, You're worthy of all of the glory, and all of the honor. All of the praise. Take your time on this one. Thank you, Lord. It makes me want yes, to shout. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Unto Jesus. You, Lord. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory and all of the honor. And yes, Lord. All the praise and 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 all the praise. So, 
Father, we just commit to you. Lord, as we look about what you have done, how faithful you have been, how faithful you are. God, I pray that as we walk out these doors, as we go home, as we go to our various places, oh God, we, we cry out, let this be the year of return. God, let this be the year of return. May 2021 not be known for whatever it's been known for. Let it be the year, not just to slowly, but Lord, let it be a true year of return. A year of return of hearts, of our children. A year of return of jobs. A year of return of, of income, our, our blessings upon our households. The year of return of our faith and our spirituality, our vitality when it comes to our faith in you. Oh God, we are believing it's the year of return. God, we're coming back. Zachariah, if we return to you, you'll return to us. And so, Lord, let there be a great outpouring, we pray, in these days ahead. Lord, the things we've lost sight of, just as the woman lost sight of her house and her property, but she came back, it was time to return. God, I pray that we would see it take place in our lives. Lord, it's not because we try harder. It's not because we work up more energy. It's not because we're good or we're bad or any of those things. It's totally because of you and your mercy, oh God. It's because we fall on you that we can be returned. The things that have been lost may be died from our heart. The hope that has been stolen. Today, oh God, return it, we pray. Let this be the year of return. We pray in Jesus' name. And if, you are, if you're reaching out to grab a hold of that, would you say amen? amen? Let it be, oh God, this day. Amen. Well, Lord, bless you as you go. Be with you. 